Like Jeremy said, my name is Brett. I'm, the, I'm a physician assistant and director of the LVHN Street Medicine Program. Um, before I get started, I wanted to thank you so much for bringing all the donations outside. Um, that stuff is so important to us, and the reason why is because our patients are all, are all homeless, and I'll go into the, uh, what the program is in a second, but it's, healthcare is very different than just medical care. And for our patients who are sleeping outside, don't know where the next meal is gonna come from, don't know where um, they're gonna sleep tonight and if they're gonna be safe where they sleep tonight, it's very difficult for them to care about taking their blood pressure medications, taking their diabetes medications, when that's something that might not hurt them for years down the road. So the stuff that, that you guys brought in today is so important for us to get them out of, I call it Maslow's basement, if anybody is familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the basic physiologic needs, get them out of Maslow's basement up to where they can actually care about their health care. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so the title of the presentation is Building Homeless Healthcare Systems on the Frontier. Previously, I, I used to call it Delivering Healthcare to the Frontier, and I changed it because our program is really evolving. The whole idea of the program was that everybody matters. And when we start with that, we see that certain segments of the population, for us it's the homeless, but there are others, um, don't access care the way everybody else does. So the top three reasons are lack of transportation, lack of insurance, and lack of trust, all under this very unstable environment of being homeless. When we used to call it delivering health care, I thought it gave it more of like a missionary um, sound to it where we would be delivering something and coming back, and we're not doing that anymore. Now we are establishing a whole system of health care designed specifically for the homeless in mind. Um, so, so that's how we're changing. Um, the way that we do this, there's, there's uh, three main parts to the program. There's the clinics in the shelters and soup kitchens. Um, again, think about insurance, transportation, and trust. We are located where they're already going and already feel comfortable, so they don't need transportation. Everything is completely free. Medications, labs, diagnostic studies are all free, so they don't need insurance. And we have the same people that come and see them over and over again. So the full-time employees are myself and Laura, who is our nurse. But since we've started two years ago, was like the official launch of the LVHN program. We've had over 200 LVHN employees volunteer with us, 84 of which are providers, doctors, PAs, and nurse practitioners. So it's truly been a, a huge effort from the network to, to make this work. And and further, last winter we took a collection, there was 5,600 plus pounds of goods collected just from network employees that we've been delivering all year. So uh, it, it really is an amazing place to work when you look at those figures. Um, the second part of the program is, is the street team. So we talked about how we have clinics in the shelters and soup kitchens and that everybody matters, but not everybody is willing to come to the shelters and soup kitchens. So for them, we go to them and deliver health care on the streets, in the woods, under the bridges. Um, I have a backpack that I'll dispense medications out of. We'll draw labs outside. Um, everything done on site. And then the last part is the hospital-based consult service, where if somebody is identified as being homeless and admitted to the hospital, we'll come see them, help the medical team understand what their version of homelessness looks like. So are they sleeping in a shelter where they get three meals a day in a clean bed? or do they keep coming in with a non-healing wound and they're sleeping next to a stream that's the same stream that they bathe in, urinate, defecate in, and drink from. So all this can impact their health care. Um, are they an insulin-dependent diabetic living in the woods without anywhere to refrigerate their insulin? So we help the medical team understand those things, and then on discharge, we follow, them up, follow up with them on the street, make sure they got their meds or taking them correctly and prevent readmissions. So, um, in the past year, we have gotten a little bit of press um, for the work that we've been doing. It, it was never something that I've been particularly comfortable with, but in a lot of ways, our folks are very invisible. And um, if I can, uh, in, in some way, show people what they're experiencing um, without 
obviously any exploitation or anything like that, but show people what they're experiencing. And yes, this is the Lehigh Valley, and it's definitely here. Um, so I just wanted to show you one of the quick videos. This was uh, on CNN. <coughs> So street medicine is really a program that was born out of the idea that everybody matters. We see that there are certain segments of the population um, that just don't access health care the way everybody else does. Because Allentown is a relatively small city, it is still surrounded by woods. So most of the homeless you're not going to see sleeping outside on the street. So they go live in the woods and tents. So that's usually where we have to go to find our patients. I have a backpack with over 20 medications. We have a EKG machine. We do point of care testing where we can get different blood work. The whole idea is to deliver quality care on site in a place where the patient feels comfortable. Do you still have that inhaler, Mike? Yeah. How often are you using that? 102 over 68. 98.4. Everything we do is completely free. We provide free medications, free labs, free diagnostic studies, so they don't need insurance. And we have the same incredible people that see them all the time. They get to know us and trust us, and uh, we're lucky enough that they allow us to help them. Okay, just breathe normal. Doing this job can be extremely difficult. You just see things that are really hard to see and, and sometimes feel helpless. But one of the things that, that I always try to do is just try and completely forget myself in it. To remember that this is not about me at all, it's just about the patients. It doesn't matter if I'm tired, it doesn't matter if I'm frustrated with trying to help somebody. It just doesn't matter about me, it matters about them. So I try and focus on them and their needs. All right, so that, that'll give you a, a little bit of an idea about what it looks like when we go out, out there. It's not what you would necessarily expect. Um, in the Lehigh Valley, people don't actually sleep on the streets very often. Um, they get beat up, they get urinated on. Um, unlike some other cities where people are used to being, are used to seeing that um, here, it, it is, they would stick out very much. So I talked about how we were kind of going through an evolution. We are now part of the community health department, which has been extremely exciting because we get a lot more resources um, and uh, folks that can help us with data and analyze some of the things that we're doing. Um, I th a lot of people think this is a really great thing to do, but we want to see that it's actually working. So it's been extremely helpful being part of the community health department. So now to bring it back onto the streets, because even though we're in the community health department, this care doesn't happen in the hospital, it's outside. So um, over the course of a year, 1.5 million in the United States are homeless, 41% are families. That is true also in the Lehigh Valley, about those same numbers. And 44% of the homeless are employed, um, which is a number that, that shocked me until I really started working with them. And, um, and, and you see that there are whole camps of people that, that work, and the people that they work with don't realize that they're outside and, and homeless. One of the main reasons is that lack of affordable housing. This is a map in the United States um, of the number of hours. E some of you might be able to see some of the numbers, but the number of hours per week that somebody has to work at minimum wage to afford an apartment. So um, on this map, Pennsylvania is 78 hours a week. Um, I actually, it, it has been updated. It's now 89 hours a week that you have to work at minimum wage to afford an apartment. And that's just not realistic um, to expect from somebody. So um, the face of homelessness might be a little bit different than what you would picture in your head. Um, of note, New Jersey uh, does hit the 100 hour a week mark.
Um, and the homeless are sick, which is part of the reason why we're here, right? So the average life expectancy is 42 to 52 years. Uh, the reason for the range is because there's different studies and it depends on who they counted um, as part of the study, but I don't think it really matters. Even if it's 52 years, that's, that's very low. I don't know of any other social determinant of health that decreases life expectancy by almost 30 years. 38% have two or more major medical illnesses. There you go. 25% with severe mental illness. This might be lower than some people think. This is, uh, it, it's severe mental illness. So bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, not, not um, your a average depression or anxiety. And, and again, this is about what we see, maybe, maybe a little more. Sorry, the clicker is not. There we go. And 30% with a drug use disorder. This was a recent study that was published. I can tell you for our patients, this is very low. And this study was performed before the opioid epidemic, so I wonder if they redid it now, what, what it would be. The first clinic that I started was at the Allentown Rescue Mission, which is affiliated with, with the DeSales Physician Assistant Program. Um, and my wife runs that clinic now, and she's doing a study. And the preliminary data shows it, well over 90% have um, either current or history of drug use disorder. And they use healthcare a lot, too because we're in the healthcare system and we care, one, how healthy they are and how they utilize healthcare, because maybe there's something we can do to affect that. So they have more hospitalization days, more cost per day. They stay longer for each admission, so the average length of stay of a homeless person is nine days, which is four days longer than a housed patient, and the 30-day readmission rate, 50.8%. So for, uh, for comparison, it's about 20% um, for the housed population. So when they come, they're coming often, they're, and then when they get discharged, they come back often and they stay a long time and they're still sick. The good news is, is that by providing basic primary care on the street, we can decrease ED visits by 80%. When I first saw this number, I thought there is no way you can decrease anything by 80%. But when you think about it, if there was no more primary doctors, nobody could have a family doctor, and the only way to access healthcare was through the emergency department. That was the only point of entry into the system. You could see how ED visits would just skyrocket. So that's how they access healthcare. So um, we're not doing really anything special, just providing a different outlet and that basic primary care that we all have access to in a different location where, where they can access it and feel comfortable. And this is how we do it, which um, we talked about briefly. So the shelters and soup kitchens, right now we have seven locations in Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. They're all pretty much set up the same way. There's a, a small pharmacy on site that we, that, that we dispense medications out of, and we don't change anything in the, in the structure itself, um, and we try not to change anything in the look of it. So this is their shelter. We are using their space. And um, very often they'll contribute into how it looks. So maybe they'll, some of the residents will help put up a wall, they'll decorate it for us. I want them to feel a part of it and them to feel like this is their clinic and we're just guests in it. Um, so like I said, we have seven sites right now. The street team, we cover um, Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton as well. There's camps in, in all three cities and that's a very much evolving thing. Um, I would say right now in Allentown, it's much higher than I've ever seen it. Um, and in Bethlehem, Easton is a little bit lower than I've seen it recently. So it, it's something that we're always keeping, keeping tabs on. Um, there are many patients that will not see me anywhere else besides on the streets. Um, and I don't think that they deserve any less quality health care than anybody else if that's where they feel comfortable getting it. So we've really tried to beef up the quality of care that we're delivering out there. So like I said, we can dispense medications. We'll take blood work. Um, I don't like taking blood work in the woods or under the bridges because then our day's over, we have to go home. 
if we have blood. Um, but if that's the only way I know that they're going to get the blood work, that's what we do. Um, I mentioned in the video we have an EKG machine. It's called a Smart Heart Pro. It's the size of my fist. It goes around the chest wall and gives a full 12 lead directly into EPIC. So everything we do is in EPIC. So if they access care anywhere in the network, they can see that we've been seeing them. Um, and the last part is the hospital-based consult service. We see between 25 and 30 consults a month um, in the hospital. So it's been, um, I just counted, it's almost 500 that, that we've seen over the past two years, a, a little more than two years, uh, which is much more than I thought. I was expecting maybe seven or eight a month. Um, and I worked as a hospitalist before I did this, so I thought I knew who was in the hospital, but I didn't. It's way more than I thought. So how are we doing? Right? We have this program. We think it's OK. So what are some of the outcomes that we can measure? Um, the 30-day readmission rate is, is one that we talked about before that you know that the hospitals are always looking at. So the published data shows 50%. When we first started, the patients before I saw them were also about 50% readmission rate. Um, and then over the next year, it was 27%. But the past two quarters, were down to 10%. 30-day readmission rate. And um, people ask people, how, how did you get it down that low? And there's, there's a few reasons. Number one, luck. All it's going to take is one super utilizer that's going to blow that out of the water that I just can't get out of the hospital or keep out of the hospital. Um, and, and we haven't had that, thank God, over the past two, uh, six months. Um, and actually since then, too. Um, so I think we're probably going to level out somewhere in the 20s. Um, I can't see how the homeless would come back less than the house population. But we'll see how it goes. But the other reason, besides luck, is that, like I said, we're just providing basic primary care. So you all, without primary care, would be sicker too. So all we're doing is giving them this care that, that we all get. The other thing that, that we do is we sign them up for insurance. So going back to insurance, transportation, and trust. And I'll tell you why this is important to us. It's important um, because, well, it's, a, it's good for the hospital to get paid for what they do. But the main reason why this is important to us is because when our patients go into access care in a more traditional setting, they, they feel like they belong there. It's not a charity case anymore. They have something that they can offer. And... Um, and, they, th and they, do are, they do get looked at differently when they have insurance than if they're uninsured. So it's really a way of empowering them that they can take control of their own health care. And that leads to taking the control on other things in their lives as well. Getting the homeless insurance is not an easy thing to do. There's no address. There's no IDs. In order to get an ID, you need a license or a social security card. Um, and a birth certificate, and if you have none of those three things because you live in a, in a tent in the woods, you have to start from ground zero. So um, we've been willing to take the time to go through that process with them, and it can take, it can take months. So it, it took a few months for us to really see a jump once things started getting approved. Um, the other thing, so we've established that there's homeless in the country and that they're sick. And maybe we're helping a little bit. But what we haven't looked at is how many homeless are there. And uh, people used to ask me, how many homeless are there in the Lehigh Valley? How many are coming into LVHN? And I really couldn't tell you. Because all the ways that we measure um, are very, very inaccurate. So the only way to find out is to ask. So we developed a five-question screening tool. There's three definitions of homelessness, so this complicates things. There's HUD, HHS, and the VA has their own definition. So in order to make the screening tool, it had to be present in two out of the three of those definitions. The first one is, is at risk for homelessness. It's not homelessness. The rest are, are all homelessness. So last, um, last summer and this past winter, we screened in the emergency department. We had all these students. It was incredible. And research scholars and residents. And it was, a, it was an official IRB research study because um, I wanted it to be good. And these are the results that we got. So we screened 4,499 patients, so a pretty good sample size. If you um, direct your attention to the middle, 
you'll see the percent homelessness. So at 17th Street, 14%, Cedar Crest, 5%, Muhlenberg, 6%. And these numbers were much bigger than I thought they were going to be. Um, even at Cedar Crest, 5% might not sound that, that much, but we have 45 beds. So at any given time, there's two. And I know that I'm not getting consulted on those. So the aggregate for the whole network uh, weighted for the size of the ERs was 7%. Um, these are unduplicated patients. So if they took the survey, they would not be able to take it again. And that comes out to 9,250 patients over the homeless patients over the course of the year coming into the emergency department. So it, it is a, a substantial group. Say that number again. 9,250. So, so if you were to try and keep, it, keep saying it accurately, you, you wouldn't say there's 9,250 homeless in the Lehigh Valley, but over the course of a year, 9,250 homeless access the health care system. And the Lehigh Valley Health Network. And, and the interesting thing, too, is that when, as I was trying to figure this out before the, b before the study, I got the local shelter census data and, and asked each of the shelters to tell me the number of unique individuals that they serviced over the course of the last year. And I added them all up. And there might be some crossover where somebody went to more than one shelter, but there's really not that many shelters in the Lehigh Valley. And they're all pretty specialized. So the Allentown Rescue Mission is only men, Salvation Army, women and children. So there's not too much overlap. And the number came out to a little above 10,000 um, if you add up the shelter census data. So I think it's probably pretty accurate. Um, there was one other uh, study that was similar to ours. It was done in Australia. And they came out with an aggregate of 7% homeless also. So, so that's also. Uh, shows us that maybe this is, this is correct. This, besides the prevalence, though, I think this was even more shocking for me, is that there was no statistical significant difference in gender. So you are just as likely to be homeless as a female as you are a male. And all the research that we looked at before that was published definitely showed more male, about 70 to 30%. And uh, although it's changing, I see national data, now it's like 65 to, to 35. So, so why did ours show that there was no difference? I think there's a few reasons. Um, number one, we asked a general population. When we did a literature review and you looked at how they identified the homeless, they did not do it in a systematic way like we did it. Um, so I think part of it is, is how you identify the homeless. So, in the, so in, in the Lehigh Valley, and we're talking about emergency shelter beds, in Allentown, there's over 100 for men at the Allentown Rescue Mission. There's six for women. In Bethlehem, no emergency shelter beds for anybody. And in Easton, there's 20 for men and 14 for women. So over the Lehigh Valley, you have 120 plus beds for men and 20 for women but our research is showing that the numbers are the same. So where are all the women? So I started asking the women, why are we seeing this? And there's not a lot of shelter beds. And they, they looked at me and they said, you know, I felt silly. They said, when you're a woman, there's always one thing that you can trade for food and shelter, and that's yourself. So I started asking them, uh, have you, ever or felt the need to trade sex for housing or food. And I was amazed at how many people were saying yes. Um, and this was very much bothering me. And then there was one patient that came in, and she had um, a, a two-year-old girl. And I asked her that question. And she said, she said that she had. Um, and she told me about this arrangement that she had with this gentleman where um, she was staying there, her and her daughter would stay there, and he would provide them with food in exchange for her taking on at least 10 men a day with all the money going to him. And I asked her, why would you do something like this? And she said, if I didn't do it, I would be on the street and I would lose my daughter probably forever. 
So she had to make the decision, do I take this deal with this guy or do I lose my daughter forever? And um, I didn't think anybody should have to make that decision. So one of the things we're really focusing on is trying to boost the number of, of beds for women in a shelter or in a transitional living uh, facility because um, this is gonna keep happening. And, and what it really amounts to is sex trafficking. Um, so I started looking into it because the money is all going to this guy, it's not going to her, which would be more prostitution, right? So, and I found out that the Lehigh Valley is a big highway for sex trafficking. So we have um, uh, the Truth Home, which is, uh, DeSales also has a clinic at the Truth Home, which is a shelter for sex traffic survivors. And there's VAS, Valley Against Sex Trafficking, with, which is an advocacy group. But um, so much so that the Department of Homeland Security has stationed Agent Stephanie Snyder here full time to take care of this uh, problem in the Lehigh Valley. So this was one of the places that one of our patients was staying. And I like to tell this story because um, he had, he has always and will continue to inspire me. And also, the, what happened to him um, and how the network really embraced him also continues to inspire me. So this, there's a, this gentleman, he lived in that drainage pipe for four years. And how I met him was through the consult service. Um, he was exactly 50 years old. And he came in um, with belly pain and they scanned him and he had metastatic colon cancer everywhere. Um, and he was, for those of you that know, he was just barely old enough to even get a colonoscopy. Um, so metastatic colon cancer everywhere. Uh, decided that he did not want treatment. Um, at the time, he, so this was in downtown Allentown. I'll tell you where, where about where it is because it's not there anymore. Um, but uh, like off Martin Luther King, around Martin Luther King area, and he was walking to Airport Road for work every day. Um, so that's how much he was trying to make himself better. Um, so I felt really bad discharging him back to that with his uh, metastatic cancer diagnosis. So I talked to our um, colleagues at hospice, and in order to go to inpatient hospice, usually um, life expectancy is like a week or less, and you need some sort of um, skill. So respiratory support, pain management, and he didn't really have any of those things, but they too felt bad discharging him to, to this, so they, so they said that they would have a bed for him. So I thought I did something great, right? I walk in, I'm like, don't worry about it. We got a bed for you. You don't have to go back to the drainage pipe. He said, but didn't you say that everybody there is gonna die within a week? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, well then, that means they need the bed more than I do. So I'm not gonna go there. And he went back there instead. And um, then we actually did like a street palliative care, street hospice out there with him. He's still the only person I've ever given opiates to, or narcotics, because um, I thought he, he would deserve it. And he, and he continued to get worse, as you would expect him to get worse. Um, we eventually uh, did help him get into an apartment. A guy rented him a, an apartment for $150 a month, which is enough to cover his expenses. So he got into the apartment, still did not want to go into hospice. We helped him support himself in the apartment. And while he was there, he would come see me at the soup kitchen. And I would let him walk, because it was a few blocks walk, and it would kind of tell me how well he was doing. And it started getting to the point that he was looking pretty bad. And, um, and it, it was right around Christmas time, and he came in and, and said that he, he was vomiting, he was, um, you know, had loose bowels everywhere, and, I said, I'm sorry, it's time, it's time for you to go into the unit. He said, I can't go into the unit. I said, why not? He said, my place is a mess, and I can't, that guy was nice enough to rent this to me at such a cheap pr price, I have to go back and clean it. And I'm like, you can't go back and clean that. He could barely walk. So we all went and we cleaned for him, um, and he, he insisted on helping, and he did. Um, went into the hospice unit, and 
um, they really adopted him. And uh, he did pass away there um, inside, supported by people rather than in the drainage pipe. And um, after he passed away, uh, the, the one thing that he did tell me was that he was Catholic and he wanted to know if he could get back into the church, even though he hadn't been to church in, in, in decades. So we had a priest come see him. Um, he said he didn't have any burial arrangements he wanted. He just wanted a casket with a cross on it. So we were able to get one donated. He had the casket with the cross on it and one of the funeral homes donated a funeral and the place was packed with uh, LVHN employees and um, everybody, and we all stood up and said something about him. So, um, you know, his courage on what he had out there and the selfless thought that he had despite living here and despite having this terrible diagnosis, um, still thinking about the other folks that might be dying before him um, and his apartment. I don't think about cleaning my apartment that much. Um, uh, will always continue to inspire me. So when we meet a lot of our patients first, um, this is how they feel. This is on a, a train switch in Easton on the way into one of the camps. Sorry, folks, the future is canceled. Because being homeless is very dehumanizing. You sleep in places that people shouldn't sleep, eat things that people shouldn't eat. Um, I, I saw a study one time where they watched somebody panhandle, and one in only 600 people acknowledged them as as being human. So imagine going through your life, one and only 600 people acknowledge you. Um, so a lot of times, they will purposefully suppress that human feeling within them. Um, and we can kind of see it happening. Uh, there was one patient that was, he was uh, beat up pretty bad and was admitted here. I went in to see him and he said, you know what, Brett, I didn't even fight back. I said, why didn't you fight back? He said, my life's not worth fighting for. And um, so he had purposefully suppressed that f feeling of humanity because he felt unwanted, unloved, nobody to nobody. And um, it was easier this way for him. But a lot of them have so much hope um, that just like our, our friend in the drainage pipe uh, always continue to inspire me and make me work even harder for them. So this was uh, somebody's front yard. He was living in a overturned dumpster. And um, one of the things that's very important to them is sanitation. So going back um, you know, a, a hundred years, one of the biggest advances in medicine was sanitation, even more so than antibiotics. Um, and because of where they're living, they have to go back to that too. So this was in, in his front yard. This is his urinal. Um, so he would urinate in that and then bring it somewhere else and dump it in the, somewhere else near the camp. But above the urinal is a book, Prayer, Faith, and Healing. And that's the book he was reading. And I just thought it was incredible that here's a guy living in a dumpster with his urine in his front yard and he still has hope. And I think more than anything, that's what we try and provide for our patients is just the, the hope that somebody knows that they're out there cares that they're out there, and is trying to make them better, um, much more than any blood pressure medication that we can give them. So just some take home messages. Um, the homeless are here. And as a community, we should decide if we're okay with that. And if we're not, how can we change it? Um, people are trying to work and still can't afford housing going back to that 89 hours a week at minimum wage to afford an apartment, that we have a system, we have a healthcare system designed specifically for the homeless that works, but it's not enough right now. Um, we're not covering even close to what we're able, what, what we should be covering. Um, and you can help us because you are our, our advocates in the community and our advisors. So when you go to whatever job you go to or organizations that you belong to or boards that you sit on or all the things that I know you guys are very busy people. Um, just keep them in mind and if there's anything um, that your organizations might be doing that, that could possibly help them and help the community get out of this, 
Dr. Nestor always says, we're only as healthy as the least healthy members of our community. Any questions? Yeah. So do you work at all with uh, the social workers through the high school to know the number of students in the high school that are homeless? So w we don't, but Allentown School District employs Rooster. <laughs> 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 and we work with Rooster. So we're like one, one, for those of you who don't know Rooster, because I'm sure not everybody knows Rooster. So he, he, was, uh, he works for the Allentown School District. His real name is not Rooster. And he was um, hired in 1986 on a grant that was designed to get homeless kids into school. And he's the only one left on the grant, which you could imagine, starting in 1986. But every year he reports to, to the state how many homeless children um, he's helped. And um, since I've been involved, it's been going up every year, and it's about 700 in the Allentown School District alone. The problem is that there's only one rooster, and no other school district has him, and he only has one of himself. So. Does that collaborate, though, with the mothers who have children? Yes, very much. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, you, you began this program, is that correct? Yeah. When you got started, how did you do that? I mean, you had to, did you put a proposal together? Who did you go talk to? I mean, what convincing did you need to do? Because it's forward thinking. And, and so I'm curious on how that happened. A lot of it was divine intervention, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I mean, how we got started here is, well, I had the clinic at the rescue mission. And I think having that clinic, it had been in existence for maybe five or six years. But it gave some credibility um, to the delivery methods and um, that, that we could make this work. And how we originally started here was it was completely volunteer. Um, through the APC Advanced Practice Committee, um, and it was it was mostly APC run, where we went to Safe Harbor. That was the first clinic that we opened, which is in Easton. We chose that because there was nothing within walking distance for them to go to. So so we went to Easton, and had the clinic there for a while, and um, it really started bothering me, both at the rescue mission and at Safe Harbor, that once we we were all see people in the shelters, but once they left, we would lose track of them. And I would say, what happened to so-and-so? Because I know their medical history, and I know that they need medicine and are, are not doing well. They said, oh, they probably got a place with a friend or something like that. And I knew that, that wasn't true. So I had to go out and find them. And that's how the street component got started. And when I wanted to do the street medicine and um, open up more clinics because I saw what the need was. And, and I have to admit that I did not even, I wasn't even close to knowing how much the need was. But my perception was that it was more. Um, we were able to get a uh, Anderson grant funded through the pool trust to give me one day a week on the street. So I was working with the hospitalist every Wednesday was my street day. And I'd do street rounds and opened up another clinic. And then we got enough data together that we were able to get a PA Department of Health grant um, that funded my salary and some medications. So that's sort of, it, it evolved very much. But um, from the beginning, Dr. Salas Lopez was, was our, our biggest advocate. She allowed us to start um, the clinic at Safe Harbor. Um, but everyone's been amazing. Uh, first off, I think what you're doing is absolutely commendable and admirable, and I'm very proud of the hospital and yourself. I become very interested in um, the uh, uh, the program, um, the street medicine, and I have lots of questions, but I'll only ask one right now. Okay, uh, how many of these are have you ran into? Many that are veterans on the street. The the veteran population is decreasing. Um, it's it's still larger in percentage to the general population. Right now, it's about eight percent of the homeless. So, um, so less than 8% of the general population are veterans. And uh, 
And to the government's credit, they have done a great job that if, if I find a veteran on the street tomorrow, I can get them in housing within a week. There's, no, there's nothing else like that that I can get people in housing so quickly. Very nice. Thank you very much for answering my question. Yes. I'd just like to make the announcement for Brett that the ladies, the Lehigh Valley Hospital Auxiliary has taken the street medicine program on <clears throat> and has donated $80,000 this past June and pledged $1 million for the next five years to be paid at $250,000, $200,000 a year. As ex-president, past president, I just feel I had to let everybody know what the auxiliary is doing for this program. It has touched our hearts as nothing ever has. Yeah, the, the funding from the auxiliary, well, when she told me that we were getting it, one, I almost passed out. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. I had to sit down. And, um, and two, it, it's so important because um, a lot of times we do feel like there's so much that we need to do that, and, and we can't even come close to meeting the need. And now we, we can meet it much better than we used to be able to meet it. Yeah. So it's incredible. I, I have one last question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hi. I have one last question. I'm just asking more about Allentown. There's been all the redevelopment downtown. Has that displaced many people to, has it created more homelessness? I know that the cost of apartments is probably going up downtown. I mean, it's all a wonderful thing, but have you seen uh, more homeless because of the development that's gone on down there at all? Um, I don't know that I can directly relate it to the development. Um, our, our patients, the, so the low cost housing that lost was not really their housing because they're homeless. But it makes it hard, much harder for them to get in somewhere. Right. Um, and, uh, and I have noticed more homeless in Allentown. I, I can't say it's directly related to that, but it is more than it used to be. All right, thank you very much, Brett, for your presentation today. <laughs> So in closing, we hope some of the items that the membership collected today will help you in your continued efforts with the street medicine program. To our guests that are here today, if you've enjoyed the presentation and have interest in becoming a member of our board, please feel free to complete an invitation on the uh, registration table out front with the member who invited you. Our next meeting is going to be held Wednesday, October 12th right here. It is going to be our member's choice topic uh, that we, was chosen at the social mixer, which will be a uh, topic about brain and nerve conditions. So we'll be featuring a program on the gamma knife radio surgery, which uses precision radiation to treat cancerous and non-cancerous conditions of the brain and nerves in a minimally invasive way. So that said, I've arranged for the rain to stop for you all to leave today. Uh, so uh, have a wonderful end of the summer, and we will see you back here in October. Thank you very much.